He's both the winningest rider in American motocross history and no doubt the most popular. Joining Hannah on the U.S. team riding a 500cc Kawasaki was Jeff Ward. Ward is from Mission Viejo, California, and at that time was a four-time U.S. national champion. Rounding out the team, Rick Johnson from El Cajon, California. Johnson, a member of Team Honda, competed in the 250 class. Two European countries figured to give the U.S. squad the most trouble. The Belgian team with two world champions, George Jobet in the 500 class and Eric Gabors in the 250 class, were rated extremely tough. Their 125 rider, Mark Velkeneers, finished ninth in the 87-125 World Championship. The Dutch team was headed by former Unadilla 250 Grand Prix winner, Case van der Ven. He rode the 500 class. 1987-125cc World Champion, John Vandenberg, rode a 250 for the Dutch team. Former 125 rider, Davy Strebos, rode in the 125 class. In addition to the Belgians and the Dutch, there were 14 other countries, all with excellent riders, shooting for the world championship title that had gone to the U.S. for the previous six years. To win, they'd have to tame one of the roughest tracks in the world, Unadilla. When it's dry, it's tough and unforgiving. When it's muddy and slippery, it borders on impossible. The first moto was for 125s and 500s. The 250 riders watched this one from the sidelines. The gate drops. The 41st annual Motocross to Nations, the World Team Championship of Motocross, was underway on a muddy, slippery Unadilla track. Before things could get sorted out, there was a pileup in the first corner. The mud had already taken its first victims. Hannah on the 125 and Ward on the 500 snuck through on the inside and barely avoided the carnage. Number 10, Kurt Lundquist from Finland on a 500 was the early leader. He was followed by number 43, Case Vanderbilt, also on a 500. And there, number 45, that's Davy Strebos from the Netherlands. He led the 125 class. There's Bob Hanna. He's being passed by George Jobay. And look at the roost from Jobay's rear wheel. It splattered Hanna from the top of his helmet all the way down his flak jacket. You had to feel sorry for the riders out on a track like Unadilla in the mud and the rain. Before the moto, Jeff Ward talked about attacking Unadilla in the muck and the mire. Well, in the rain, the goggles are really important. Make sure nothing happens to that. So you keep those on at all times. And you got to be a little more cautious because it is slippery. And being on a 500, I'd, I'd rather be on one than ride behind one. I know the roost is going to be really substantial. From the opening lap, Jeff Ward rode without goggles. That was his way of coping. That's Davy Strebos trying to pick up his bike in the slippery Unadilla mud. Strebos was the leader in the 125 class. That spill by the Dutchman really jumbled up the standings. As a result, the new 125 class leader was Frenchman Jean-Michel Bale. Five-time 500cc world champion Roger DeCoster, now team manager for the U.S. squad, thinks Bale will someday be number one in the world. Time will tell. Welcome back to ESPN's Best of American Motorcycle Racing. If you've just joined us, this is not Mudbug Racing. You're watching the final laps of the first of three motos at the 1987 Motocross to Nations. You know, the Motocross to Nations has been going on for 43 years. It's acknowledged as the Olympics of Motocross. Each event is remembered for the performers and the performances. Let's take this opportunity to look back at the 1985 event. That year was significant because it marked the first time for the three-moto format. We begin our flash back into history with five-time world champion Roger DeCoster giving us his interpretation of the new format. Well, the new format is uh, three riders per country riding each in a different class, a 125, a 250, and a 500. And the scoring is done individually in each, each class is scored individually. A rider could be, for example, in um, fourth place on a 125, and he still could score for first place for his class. And then they make the best, uh, they take the best six results out of the nine heats. Gaeldorf, West Germany, served as host country to the new three-moto format event. A huge crowd of European enthusiasts turned out for the festivities, including a large contingent of American supporters. They all came to see if the Americans could make it five in a row. Riding for the U.S. were Team Honda's Ron Lachine on a 125, Team Kawasaki's Jeff Ward on a 250, and Team Honda's David Bailey on a 500cc machine. 
as was expected, when the gate dropped in all three motos, the Big Boar 500 stormed to the front, followed by a mixture of 250s and 125s. In the first moto, Ron Lachine, number three, suffered a horrible start, but still managed to work his way up to 12th overall and third in the 125 class. In motos two and three, Lachine got good hole shots and finished first in class on his 125. His best overall finish was an incredible fourth in the third moto. In the 250 class, it was all rider number two, Jeff Ward. The Kawasaki rider won the class in all three motos. His overall finishes were fifth in moto number one and third in motos two and three. The 500 class provided the stiffest competition, with newly crowned 500cc world champion David Thorpe of Great Britain taking the wins in motos one and three. He finished second in moto number two. David Bailey, the U.S. 500 entry, settled for a second in moto number one, fourth in moto number two, and sixth in moto number three. With three motos and three classes all mixed together, scoring and keeping track of team points was a nightmare. Regardless, when the last checkered flag was thrown, the U.S. team came out on top. The new format was heralded as a huge success by all. Despite the new format, though, it was clear. We were deeply embedded in the era of U.S. domination. We're back to the year 1987, the motocross to nation's first visit to the U.S. of A. We're on the final lap of moto number one. Rider number three, American Bob Hanna, is currently running fourth in the 125 class. Now, fourth place under normal circumstances is not too shabby, but this was team competition, and the teams from Belgium and the Netherlands were putting it all together. Dutch rider Case van der Ven was leading until he was passed by Belgium's 500cc world champion, George Jobay. Jeff Ward, the American entry in the 500 class, was inside of the leaders and was holding down the number three position. Unfortunately for the gritty Californian, the laps wore down and he could not improve upon his position. Belgian rider George Jobay crossed the finish line with Case van der Ven, the Dutch rider, in tow. Finishing third in the first moto was American Jeff Ward. Checking the results for Moto 1, George Jobay, the 500cc world champion, was the winner, followed by Case van der Ven in second. Ward, with a tremendous effort from the middle of the pack, finished third. In the 125 class, the prediction of a three-way championship battle between the U.S., Belgium, and the Netherlands was right on. Jean-Michel Bale from France took the number one spot. But look at the next three positions, Holland, Belgium, and the USA. In team scoring after the first moto, Belgium with a first and a third, and the Netherlands with a pair of seconds were tied for the lead. The U.S. squad with a third and a fourth were within striking distance, but would have to improve on their finishing positions in the next two motos. Welcome back. The riders for Moto2 are on the line. This moto would consist of 125s and 250s. For the U.S., it was Rick Johnson on the 250, and back for his second ride of the day, Bob Hanna on the 125. The gate went down, and Moto2 number two was underway. The rain was still coming down. The mud at the first turn was deep and slippery, but the entire field made it through. Both U.S. riders were close to the front. Before the moto, Rick Johnson talked about the importance of a good start in a race with these type of conditions. I put a lot of emphasis on the start um, because if you're in front, you're the one throwing the mud. If you're behind, you're the one catching the mud. And uh, I, I make a real hard effort in the beginning of the race to get myself to the front of the pack. And when I when I pass people, I don't I don't mess around. I don't follow them and push them like I would on a, if it was just a, a you know a tacky day where it's not a lot of mud and not a lot of slop. Rick Johnson wasn't messing around on this day. During the 86 and 87 seasons, Johnson was the dominant force in U.S. motocross. The Honda star took the lead in the second moto, and despite the conditions, began pulling away from the rest of the field. That's Davy Strebos, the 125 rider from the Netherlands. He was leading the 125 class, but Unadilla's favorite son, Bob Hurricane Hanna, took over. With Strebos out of the running, the team from the Netherlands suffered a serious setback. As in most sports, one player's problem is another player's success. And in this case, Bob Hanna and the U.S. team were the benefactors. As a result of Strebo's problem, Bob Hanna and Rick Johnson were leading their respective classes. You can bet, however, that neither Hanna or Johnson were feeling overconfident in these treacherous conditions. The best in the world were right behind them, and they knew it. That's 250cc world champion Eric Gabor. It's from Belgium with the yellow jersey breathing down Johnson's neck. Gabor's teammate and first moto winner, George Jobay, moved to the edge of the track to cheer Gabor's on. Before the moto, a clean Eric Gabor's told us why the motivation for him and his fellow countrymen was so strong. 
just look at the past and you know why because the Americans have been winning five years now in a row and uh, you know you have to do something about it uh, if you have a fighting spirit or if you are a real sportsman you know you don't let go you try to improve and try to do better than the competition sometimes you can try too hard Gabor's went down the muddy Unadilla track was claiming even world champions as its victims. The question was whether Gabor's would be able to hold on to second. The answer was no. John Vandenberg, the Dutch 250 rider, bobbled, and Bob Hanna moved into the lead in the 125 class, and an amazing third overall. The Hurricane was putting together an unbelievable ride. One of the reasons many feel Hanna is the best that ever laced on a motocross boot is his dedication to testing the motorcycle. The sight. Carlsbad, California. For many years, the home of the U.S. 500cc Motocross Grand Prix. On this day, though, there were no crowds, no applause, no trophies. Yet the rider on that Suzuki was riding 10 tenths, all out. This is what testing is all about. If you don't go all out, you can't test the integrity of the motorcycle and its collective parts. Hannah loves the challenge. Besides, what's that old saying? Practice makes perfect. Pat Alexander, American Suzuki's motocross team manager, keeps times. But when it's right, Hannah knows it, and the lap times can become irrelevant. Having a rider like Hannah doing development has made the Suzuki line of production motocross bikes more competitive with the other Japanese brands. Bob's helped us develop the RM motors and the suspension and just about every aspect of the bike, brakes from brakes all the way down to engine power. It's, it's been really, he's really, really been something special for us. Bob Hurricane Hanna has been special for anyone who derives pleasure from watching the best in action. Just ask the fans who attended the 87 Motocross The Nations. We'll return to the 1987 Motocross The Nations as the best of American motorcycle racing continues on ESPN right after these messages. Welcome back to ESPN's Best of American Motorcycle Racing. I'm Bruce Flanders, and we're in the closing stages of Moto Number 2 of the 1987 Motocross Donations. On the muddy Unadilla track, the battle continued among the three countries that were favored. The host team, the U.S., Belgium, and the Netherlands. In Moto Number 2, however, it was all Team America. Even though you cannot tell who's who, underneath the mud is Number 2, Rick Johnson, leading the 250 contingent and overall Moto leader. There's Bob Hanna. He's first in the 125 class and, believe it or not, third overall. This format, with three motos, with two classes per moto, was first used in the 1986 Motocross Donations. Let's go back in time and relive Team America's victory in the 40th running of this prestigious event. Italy served as the host country. Although it cannot be proven, it's generally accepted that the change in format in 85 and 86 was an attempt to nullify the American dominance. It was felt by many that the European strength in the 125 class, combined with a break or two in the 250 and 500 classes, could possibly halt the U.S. win streak. Riding for the U.S. was David Bailey on the right, Rick Johnson in the center, and their Honda teammate, Johnny O'Mara. In the first moto, the 125s would run with the 250s. The 48 rider field dictated a two-row start, with team members lined up one behind the other. The Americans, with O'Mara in the front, were on the extreme right of your screen. Omar on the 125 gated perfectly and immediately made room for Johnson on the faster 250. With a thank you very much, Johnson blasted into the corner number one with Omar on his rear wheel. When the dust had cleared and the front runners had sorted themselves out, Johnson, number two, was in second and number three, Omar on the 125 was in fourth, but not for long. Within two laps, the Americans were in first and second. They took control of the race and held it. The route had begun. For the second moto, O'Mara would start behind number one, David Bailey, who was riding a 500. In the group were no less than five world champions, with a combined total of 10 world championship titles. David Bailey was first off the line, with O'Mara close to mid-back. The 125s were no match for the powerful 500s, or were they? Bailey quickly opened up a big lead over the rest of the field. Behind him, though, a battle was shaping up. Number 42, David Thorpe, was in second. And number 10, George Jobay in third. In fourth, and how he got there, no one knows, was the O-Show in his 125. 
Finally, the pressure of the battle took its toll. Belgium's two-time world champion, Jobe, went down. Omara sailed by into third. For the next several laps, Omara hounded Thorpe. With just three laps remaining, he passed the Englishman, and once again, American riders were in first and second. Bailey won the moto, but it was Johnny Omara on his little 125 that stole the show. The route was well underway. The third moto was for 500s and 250s. Bailey started in front with Johnson behind him. Both riders narrowly avoided a first corner pileup, but after that it was clear sailing. Bailey took the lead and left the rest of the field in his dust. By lap five, Johnson had moved to second, and that was that. On the last lap, Bailey waited for Johnson. They crossed the finish line together, and the route was completed. Even the European rules makers couldn't hold back the American juggernaut. American dominance was stamped firmly on what had been in the past European domain. Back to the action of the 87 event and the Johnson Hanna American 1 2. Johnson and Hanna were in the driver's seat, but as we have seen earlier, anything could happen. After the first moto, the U.S. team found themselves behind the Belgians and the Dutch. To get back into contention, they needed a 100% effort, and that's what they got from Johnson and Hannah. The rain was still coming down, but it didn't dampen the spirits of the huge Unadilla crowd. They were cheering for Hannah. They were cheering for Johnson. As both riders rounded every corner, accelerated down every straightaway, the chant of USA filled the air. Johnson took the checkered flag in moto number two. He won the 250 class and was the overall moto winner. A little further back, Bob Hanna won the 125 class. Moto 3 would decide the team championship. Moto 2 was over, but down on the track of muddy Bob Hanna was mobbed by the Unadilla faithful. The chant was Hannah, Hannah. The ride by Hannah on a 125 in the mud was one of the greatest exhibitions in motocross history. He bested the majority of the world's best on a machine only half the displacement of his rivals. Truly amazing. So now after two motos, this is what the team scoring looked like thanks to the American domination of Moto2. As you can see, Moto3 would be the deciding moto. It would be Belgium versus the United States for the 1987 Motocross to Nations Championship. We're on the line for the third championship deciding moto. You could bet both Johnson on the 250 and Ward on the 500 were looking for individual wins to sew up the title for the U.S. The final moto of one of the most prestigious motocross events in the world was underway. Motocross to nations, 51 riders competing for the honor of their respective countries. For most, the muddy, slippery Unadilla track had been a nightmare. For others, like our first moto winner, George Jobe, the less than ideal conditions work to their advantage, or should I say, to their liking. I like a lot the rain, I mean the mud, because it's very heavy, very technical, very slippery. So you need a lot of, a lot of technique, more than the speed. So that's what I like. In the early going of Moto3, Team USA's Rick Johnson was liking it better than anyone else, including Joe Bay. The Honda rider from El Cajon, California, shot into the lead. He knew that if either he or Jeff Ward could win their class, then the U.S. would sew up their seventh straight Motocross to Nations title. The pressure was on. If you think this was just another race, listen to Jeff Ward. Probably the biggest thing maybe all the riders think of is that uh, they have a really bad day. And, uh, you know, things just don't go right. And uh, if we lost the thing because of, you know, a specific, you know, specific rider having a really bad day, and which I don't I think we're all spot on. That, sh that shouldn't happen, but, you know, bad luck strikes at the worst times, and uh, that's what's gone through my mind. I know I have the, we have the ability to win, and uh, I should really hate to lose it here in the United States, so it's got a lot of additional pressure than it usually has. Out of camera view, the Unadilla track claimed yet another victim. This time, the victim was the reigning 500cc world champion. George's Joe Bay had pulled off the track with several yards of track banners wound up in his rear wheel. That was the end of Belgium's championship hopes. The hopes of the Dutch team, however, were still alive. Case van der Ven on a KTM was leading the 500 class. In the 250 class, his teammate John Vandenberg was running second behind Johnson. 
During the final laps, Johnson slowed slightly to guard his lead. Conversely, Vandenberg threw caution to the wind. The Dutch team needed to win both classes for the overall championship. Jeff Ward, meanwhile, had closed on Case Vanderven, but did not appear to be making a 100% effort to catch the Dutchman. Was Ward holding back? Afterwards, it was learned that Ward was instructed to hold his position and not endanger the impending overall victory. At this point in the moto, Rick Johnson, Bob Hanna, and Jeff Ward were less than one lap away from claiming the team title. For the seventh straight year, American riders would reign supreme over the best the rest of the world has to offer. The 1987 win was possibly the best ever. It was on American soil in front of thousands of American fans. There's the checkered flag for Rick Johnson. With his fist in the air, Johnson clutched the U.S. victory in his hand. Ward held his position as requested, and the fans were rewarded with the sweet victory. On this day, it didn't matter if you played the game. What mattered was if you won or lost. Team America played the game and won, and won big in front of the home crowd. For the best of American motorcycle racing, I'm Bruce Flanders.